program. A little discussion with David and Dan. I'll ask them a few questions. Um, I'm figuring that'll take 25 minutes, half an hour, maybe something like that. Um, and then we have an opportunity after that um, for people to show kind of artifacts that they brought. Um, it seems like we got a lot of good stuff here. Um, and so if you could just give a sense of kind of how this stuff connects to Millbrook history and kind of tell the history of the historical society through that angle. Um, we just mentioned we have Will Tatum. Right, you want to wave? Local history celebrity, Duchess County historian. Well, the real celebrities tonight are all of the members of the Millbrook Historical Society. Uh, uh, what false modesty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get started here. So, we are much better as an organization at celebrating, preserving, Millbrook history than we are at preserving the history of the historical society. And so there is some dispute about when exactly the 50th anniversary of the historical society was. It kind of depends what you're, what you're counting as the start. The first time any group of people got together and said, hey, we should have a historical society. The first time that they had a formal public program, when they wrote their constitution, when they elected officers. And so we've picked March 1973 as the start. That is somewhat arbitrary, but March 1973 was when the first business meeting to pass a constitution and bylaws and elect officers happened. March 21st. So we're only like five days off right, from that, if we're using that as the 50th anniversary. Um, the first officers of the historical say, let's see if people recognize any of these names. President David Graves. You recognize that name? Yes. Um, Vice President, Mrs. William O'Brien. Who is that? Sally yes. O'Brien. <laughs> Treasurer, June Wiltshire. Remember that name? Uh, Recording Secretary, Suzanne Gallucci. Uh, Mrs. Forrest Romero. Mrs. John Tiltsley. That's Edna Tiltsley. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah. And the trustees, Miss Mary Irwin, Carmine D'Arpino, you know that name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wrote the history Mary of the Irwin was, uh, uh, Mary Irwin was the, uh, well, she worked at Dutchess Day School for years. All right. Uh, Charles Tripp, Jonathan Weschler, and George Wing. Right? So 50 years ago, roughly tonight, these were the people who constituted the leadership of the Millbrook Historical Society. But now on to our, our featured guests tonight. Um, David and Dan, um, I guess I'll start with you, David. What is your first connection to Millbrook? Because you, you're not from here, you didn't grow up in Millbrook, you're from Putnam County. But what is your first memory of coming to Millbrook and being exposed to Millbrook? Yes. Uh, when I was a junior in high school. Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> She'll keep me honest. <laughs> Um, I grew up in Putnam County, and the community I grew up in was uh, had a very heavy Russian population because of the Russian Orthodox Church that was in Mahopat. And most of those people, uh, members, were, uh, had a second career. Most of them had been aristocrats in Russia. And when they came to this country, they fell onto what they had learned as when they were aristocrats. So every girl had watercolor. That was something they taught. And many of the people that I went to school with, the parents, mothers, did watercolors. And here's, here's a, a name that everyone knows here, and that's Howard Johnson's. Every Howard Johnson's had a, a cafeteria area, a glorified dining area, and the watercolors that they had were all done by the Bogdanoviches, uh, and they floral bouquets and so on. So I grew up going to their studio, their house in the country, and going into the studio, and Mrs. Bogdanovich would do the flowers, and her husband, Sergei, would do the backgrounds. So they'd turn them out, turn them out, turn them out, turn them out, and every Howard Johnson's in the country had those watercolors. That was the market for it. So that kind of experience and, and the exposure. And the other advantage was that many of the Russian 
people who were there as part of the community had ties to the Kirov Ballet and the Russian uh, opera. So music and culture was such an important part. And as a young kid growing up in Putnam County, to go there and for these special events and seeing all the men in tuxedos with the high collars and the women with their, their um, for lack of a better word, their formal outfits with the jewelry that they were able to bring and the hair piled up. I mean, it... Bring it back to Bennett. <laughs> okay, so in Bennett, thank you. She's keeping me honest. In Bennett... Uh, they had a special pres uh, pro presentation with the president of Russia. Now, we don't think of Russia as having a president, but when the Romanovs uh, left, the next person in charge was part of an organization loosely based on what we would have in this country, and there was one president, one person elected or assigned as president of the country. And we, with all the Russian connections I had, we went up to here him speak at Bennett School. And so my recollection of Bennett is coming from a public high school in Putnam County to a finishing school, basically, and to be served tea by these young ladies. And they all had gloves, they all wore gloves, and it was, for me, it was a totally different world from anything I'd experienced. And for the Russian friends who were there, to be able to talk with this one president of the, uh, what became Russia, and then the Soviets took over. So the nostalgia component for it was really amazing. And so this is maybe the late 1950s or so, when you first came to This, well, this yeah, was uh, 19, it would have been 1961, 1962, 1962. Okay. that I came. And coming to Bennett was magical, because the, the girls, the outfit, the, 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 the campus, uh, the formality, serving tea, when you think about it, uh, that, that they basically still had tea parties. Yeah. And to mm -hmm. be able to come as a high school, Putnam County high school kid, to a tea party with these beautiful young women, I mean, I was in paradise. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and it still is paradise. Still is paradise. paradise. <laughs> okay. yes. So, Nan, to jump ahead a little bit in the story, um, you and David get married and you have young kids and you're living in Putnam County. Um, how did you end up in Millbrook then at that point? Well, at that point, we were living in a, a house circa 1835, a former parsonage, and um, perfectly happy there in the Carmel School District where David taught. And then a large parcel of land adjacent to ours was on the market and was being considered as the site of an airplane parts factory. And at that point I said, we're out of here. <laughs> I am not going to stick around and wait to see what happens on that property. I want to go someplace where there are village greens and congregational churches and respect for their heritage. So we, I was originally looking in Connecticut and then a friend of ours said, check out the Newtown Bee, which was a publication. Anybody who's been around a long time and collected antiques would know the Newtown Bee, Arts and the Antiques Weekly. And our friend said there is an advertisement for a house in Millbrook. We got the bee, we, we subscribed, so we looked at it, and the photograph was so fuzzy and just so totally out of focus. It could have been anything from a chicken coop to a grand estate. But we decided, let's go up and look at it. I was off the following day because I think it was my birthday and where I worked at the time, they gave you your birthday off. So we decided we wanted to drive up and see it. And we called the realtor. He was not available to show the house that day. So David said, well, let's drive up anyway. And I said, we don't know where it is. And he said, how big is Millbrook? We'll find it. Well, we did find it. We pulled in the drive. David took one look and he went, oh, 
it's glorious. <laughs> and I said, there goes Connecticut. <laughs> and that was it. Within 24 hours, I think we had made an offer on it. And anyway, everything progressed very quickly. And we moved in five days before Christmas. Our children were young at the time. And suddenly I had these... I didn't these, understand that. <laughs> suddenly I had these quivering little kids saying, but, but mommy, how is Santa Claus going to find us? I said, trust me, he will. And that year, this very library had a wonderful program sponsored by some of the mothers that if any child dropped a letter to Santa Claus in the box in the library, they would get a response from Santa or Mrs. Claus. So our kids put letters into the box. We move in the house five days before Christmas. Someone has driven over our mailbox and knocked it down. We didn't have a mailbox to get the letters. So we literally, we got a hold of Joe Valletri. He put up a mailbox for us on Christmas Eve day. And that day, the letters from Mrs. Claus arrived. <laughs> and there was peace in the valley. <laughs> so so that's, that's the story of moving in. Yeah, and just on that subject of the house, um, I don't know if David wants to show this stuff now or wait till the end, but... Um, they brought um, a box of some of the stuff that they have found over the years. and It's been, what, 40 years? More than yeah. that since you've lived there? 84. Um, yeah, almost 44. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff that they found, like just in the garden, old pieces of glass. And, yeah, basically like for all of us, if you live uh, at an old house, the previous owners had an option. They either had garbage that they went to the back door and tossed, or if they were discreet, they went to the end of the property and uh, threw it out into a pile. And so when we moved in and put gardens in, I kept coming across bits and pieces of bottles and, and glass mm -hmm. and so on. And every single one of those is an artifact that we can date back to the kinds of things that were used and discarded. And again, they're, they're, it's just debris, but it's things that you, we learn from. And that's so important. And I would add that one of the miracles of moving in was uh, we found these shards, and one of them was a particular configuration, a square bottom, an old gin bottle. And we invited some friends to visit, and they brought a, a housewarming gift for us. He happened to be a bottle collector. And what he gave us, without knowing, was the exact bottle that that shard would have come from. So it was like, ah, it was meant to be. David, do you remember how did you first get involved after moving here with the local history community? Were there aspects of your background that kind of made you interested in local history? My whole background was in uh, American decorative arts and architecture. So I had studied in high school and uh, went off to Buffalo and majored in art history. So architecture for me, I, I love Buffalo and some of you have experiences in Buffalo. Buffalo is a checkerboard city and if you were Italian, you lived in the Italian neighborhood. If you were Polish, you lived in the Polish neighborhood. If you were German, you lived in the German neighborhood. Heaven forbid you went into one of the areas where you weren't wanted. And for me, to be able to go and visit each of those neighborhoods and ask questions from the people about what it was like, where they came from, from in Italy, where they settled, what it was like, what their businesses were, where they did their shopping, it was just so fascinating. So that was the background I had when I came here. So moving to Millbrook, I did the same thing. Uh, I talked to different families, and a name that you either love or you hate was uh, the, the Rattuno family, because Catherine Rattuno knew everything. And if you didn't agree with her, she didn't care. You absolutely, uh, she would dismiss you. 
And I, I had the advantage of being an off-comer to the area. So every one would talk to me. And uh, the Rituno sisters would invite me up and they would talk about what it was like growing up on Alden Place and the experiences there. And the Britton family, some of you knew the Brittons, as uh, the, one of the black families in the area. And they had always been here because they worked on the estates. And Alden Place was where they could buy property because no one wanted to live near the Italians. So, and those stories and experiences were just fascinating, and I, I loved it. And every, every group that I talked to had stories to share like that. Um, I want to show a couple clips here from our uh, YouTube channel. And so this is, kind of in terms of my ability to master technology, kind of the extent of <laughs> how it's going to go. We'll see. Um, but these are all um, opportunities to see David kind of present at programs over the years. I don't know if you have any sense of like how many times you've presented to the Historical Society, but definitely double digits. I mean, it's... Robert and I are both teachers, so anytime we have a captive audience like this, we're performing. <laughs> so every opportunity I had to talk to a group, I took advantage of. It's my personality, and Robert's too. That's why we're here tonight. This is also a shameless plug for our YouTube channel, where all these videos are. But you mentioned the importance of the Italian community here. So this is a program from a number of years ago about Italian heritage in Millbrook. And these clips are only like a minute or so, just to give a little flavor here. Um, but here's, here's David. Hopefully the sound works. And Luis Tompkins and what she did. Uh, we all know Luis, and what inspiration she was. Um, on a weekly basis, uh, she would, uh, old copies of the Millbrook Round Table would come, and she looked through, and she pull out in a year, like 1923, and look for what happened in 1923, and document some of the stories with the Italian community. And that's what evolved into her first paper on the Italian community. She did it in 1979, 1980. And the notes that were taken were on index cards. Now, most of us are of an age, and if I hold up my index cards, they're a little bigger than she uses, because I need to see them, so the larger they are, the easier. But this has become uh, obsolete. You ask a child today about taking notes, and they go, what? Well, so I just want to give you a sense of what some of these programs are like. Some of you may have, have been there. Um, and I wanted to show this clip in particular because it highlighted two things. One, David's system of keeping track of information. Right? He has all of these note cards. Uh, you know, filed away, kept. It is a treasure for the local history community. But also you saw in this clip um, David's um, eagerness to give credit to other people who have come before him um, and done a lot of work for Millbrook history. And so Louise Tompkins is definitely one of those those people. And some of you might be familiar with that. Um, David, you want to come back here or should we? As a matter of fact, that's over? a perfect segue into your list that you made of people deserving of acknowledgement as soon as you find your glasses. <laughs> these are the people that really, coming into this position, these are the people I relied on for their, their incredible resource and background. Louise Tompkins. Remember Louise. Louise was an extraordinary uh, individual, and Kurt Place wanted her to be the town historian. And uh, Louise Tompkins said, but, but look, look, because as you know, or don't know, she was in the infirmary and she was bedridden and paralyzed of sorts. And so she held up her hands and said, but look, when he, he asked her to be the town historian. And Kurt being Kurt, he was so pragmatic. He said, Louise, it's your mind I want, your mind. <laughs> and so she said yes, and God bless the, the records that she kept, the information, the interviews she had. Uh, she, people loved going to her and seeing her because her gift was you would go to the infirmary, you'd find her, she'd be in bed, and by the time you left, 
you completely forgot that she was in the bed. Their dialogue was just so extraordinary. What a resource she was. So that, that's the, the first. But then Carmine D'Arpino. And Carmine came and taught at Bennett. And Carmine was, uh, what's a good word, crusty. So you either uh, enjoyed him or you couldn't stand him because he knew everything. And if it weren't written down and he didn't find it written down, it didn't exist. So he could care less about what some of the people said uh, their, with their recollections. So he, he was very crusty. Uh, Sally Gifford O'Brien. Sally is another one who had the gift of being able to document and the resource she had for the community. Um, and on the subject of Sally, I hope everyone here has at one point or another taken a, taken a very good look at the wall hangings in the other room in the library because those were the project of Sally Gifford O'Brien and they are a wonderful documentation of the historic roads and buildings. So if you haven't stopped to look at them before you leave tonight, please do. And one of the, the best parts of Sally was uh, when uh, Sally was very humble and refused to come to the front of the room when she presented those to the community. And the threat was that if she didn't come to the front of the room, that the entire audience would stand up and turn around to face her. <laughs> and that's the only reason she came to the front. <laughs> Just a wonderful recollection. Scott Meyer. Scott was another one who used, used his bookstore as an opportunity for people to get together and share it. And he, Scott was the kind of person, you came in as a stranger and you left a friend so that he had the gift of being able to bring everyone together. But he, he took over the presidency of the society when it was really faltering and just built it up. Um, and look at us today with this wonderful turnout. But Scott really regenerated an interest in the history and in supporting and attending the Historical Society programs. And for me, one of the major resources was John Cading, because he would always be behind the counter in his store. And if you came in to say anything, he'd introduce you to whoever else was there. And John had the gift of bringing everyone together. And he was just a wonderful But resource. he also always had a camera yeah, always at a hand. Camera. And we've got fabulous photographs documenting every aspect of life in Millbrook. If there was an automobile accident, he'd leave the store and go out and take pictures of it. If there was something on the street, whoever it could be, he would go out and take pictures of it. What a resource. And then the last two that I have on my list are Barbara and Charlie Purse, because uh, both Charlie and Barbara are the ones for the museum in the streets. They, they brought the idea to the community uh, in the original concept was in Maine and they were all, the, the stipulation for the museum in the streets was two languages and in Maine it was always English and French and when we had it set up they loved the idea that here it would be Italian because of the Italian community. So it drew to the community together in their thoughts. So those are the people that really are part of what Some I'm... Friends. There are that's, lots. that's a wonderful segue because I have a clip of you talking at the dedication ceremony for oh. the museum in the streets. I was not there that day. I don't know where I was that I missed this, but it must have been like a cyclone that was blowing through yeah. because the weather is scary in this clip. Start on that celebration that at the bottom of Franklin Avenue, where we have an introductory panel similar to what you see on the inside of your walking path. A second identical panel is located at the Florida building, and here you will find an enriched version of Millbrook's history. That history is broad and rushed, by the way. We were so concerned about the number of characters that I couldn't, they wouldn't let me write the tone that I wanted to 
too. So it's an abbreviated version, and I apologize up front for what's left out. But the intent was to be inclusive. We started the very... So you've spoken a bunch of times at the Historical Society. You were a key figure in the Museum in the Streets project that we all love. Um, a couple other things that you've been involved in here that you might want to talk about. Um, the calendar that the bank produces and distributes. Right? How, does, how did that start? How does it come together every year? 27 years ago, uh, the decision was made to create a calendar. And that's it. 27 years ago. And basically, uh, it was a series of images, photographs, and drawings that were done that document the community. And the, and the bank published it and gave it out as a freebie as for its customers. And what's happened is the calendar, 27 years later, the calendar has ended up being sent all around the world because people who grew up here and now live in Arizona or in Milano uh, will get the calendar as part of a recollection of what it was like. And this year's, the theme are parades. And so every month features a different parade. And the look, man, for the march, because the march one is so important. The march is a parade that celebrated women and women's voting at a time when prior to women Education. could not vote. Right. So there's the float that was in the parade. And it's basically women celebrating the fact that they finally were able to vote. So and, we had parades for all of that. And the thing that always amazes me is, you know, every year as a historical society, when we get together at the end of the year and figure out, well, what are we going to have for programs here, you know, for the next year? You know, are we going to run out of ideas? Are there more topics that, that we can really discuss? And then we get together and we sit around and, you know, we usually do nine programs and we come up with about 20 topics for ideas. And I think it's the same thing with the calendar. Like, you've been doing this for 27 years. You get a run out of ideas, you know, themes for the calendar, but no, they keep coming. And what's happened is because of the calendars being sent all around the world, as people, uh, former citizens, former members of our community, uh, have passed away in, in uh, let's say, in, in Virginia, and their family members are cleaning out their, their folders and come across letters the family letters that date back to Millbrook, and at this point, no one is interested in their community. But what do you do with them? You don't want to throw out great grandma's uh, letters when she was uh, at Bennett School. So they find the calendars and have sent back to the Historical Society a treasure trove. Uh, the most amazing one was a series of World War I letters. Can you imagine having a relative serving in World War I? and this generation not being interested in any of them and finding them very difficult to read. You think of script and <laughs> things that we took for granted, but if you're 14, 15 years old, reading a letter from World War I is almost impossible because you don't have that gift anymore. So we have inherited letters and things like that from family members. Rather than throw them out, they come to the Historical Society. One more thing that you've been involved in that I think deserves mention. Um, for many years on Community Day, you would give a walking tour of the village, um, which people look forward to, I think, all year. And you always had a big crowd participate in those. How did that get started? Or it was a result, a very simple, from the, the high school uh, not having the money for field trips. So uh, field trips. For anyone who teaches, field trips are a normal extension of the class. So I would do field trips for the juniors at the high school, and we'd take a field trip from the high school through the community and talk about the names of the streets, what was here, where the railroad went through, where, what Alden Place was, and that grew into the Museum in the Streets project. So uh, the, the Museum in the Streets become a simple walking tour for students so that their teachers can take them out and go uh, through the walking tours and get a sense of what the community is. We take it for granted, but so many people look at it and say, this is a wonderful, wonderful gift. And it was because of the, the purses, 
bringing the reputations, bringing it to the community, and having it set up. And now, for the past several years, and I trust it will continue, but every seventh grader is on a, comes on a walking tour. There's a date set up in the fall, and the teachers chaperone groups of about 10 students, and there are multiple groups, and they go, they have designated spots for the museum and the streets. And the Historical Society has been wonderful about helping to staff those locations and flesh out more of what is involved at each of one of those sites. And the one stipulation for the seventh graders is every state seventh grader is then charged with taking their parents on the tour. Oh, really? And that has worked very, very well because it brings the community, the entire community, into ours. I think I told you this when we were talking the other day. I am always so personally conflicted when I see people who are clearly from out of town who are stopping and reading the historic markers because my first kind of natural instinct is just kind of respond with excitement and to go over and like introduce myself and say, hey, you know, can I show you anything around? Do you have any questions about Millbrook history? But then I realized like that might be a little overwhelming for people and they might not necessarily want that. But I think that's kind of in the tradition of David and Scott Meyer and all these people who've been involved in the historical society, right? To be a kind of evangelist for, for Millbrook history. Absolutely. And our village is such a precious commodity. But there are things that other uh, people in other communities take for granted, like sidewalks. We were one of the first communities, rural communities, that had sidewalks. And the reason was to keep people out of the streets where the horses and wagons were. You think of that, sidewalks. We take them for granted today, but that was a special effort when the village was being set up to put sidewalks in. To, and the, the benefit is certainly here. I guess I'll just ask one more question to Nan and David, and then if people have questions in the audience for them specifically, I guess they, can, they could ask, and then we'll do a little show and tell. Mm -hmm. um, kind of start with, with Nan and then, and then David. Um, is there a, a place in Millbrook, maybe other than your, your home, which drew you here, I think that was going to be your answer, um, <laughs> that you find kind of most evocative of, of Millbrook history? Well, it tells the story if, of Millbrook. If I best. may, I'm going to bring my artifact forward. Um, the other one, David was the first artifact I brought. And <laughs> this is the second. <laughs> this is one of our prized possessions. It is a sampler from the 18th century, 1799, done at Nine Partners School. And if I may, I, it was done by uh, a girl by the name of Mary Collins, Mary Collins Nine Partners Boarding School, the 29th of the 10th month. Remember, Quakers did not use the pagan names for months. They, so it would be the 29th of the 10th month, 1799, aged 10 years. Oh, and if I may, I'm just going to read you one stanza from it. There are two, two uh, selections here. One is on Providence, the other is Hymn to the Evening. But the next to the last stanza from Hymn of the Evening, I really want to share with you. Instructive, tell the pomp of state, the pride of mighty blood, that none are ever truly great that are not truly good. So that is the sentiment that I find so compelling. And I'll leave it so that you can look more closely. So that would be mine. Okay, and we can say Quaker Meeting House. And Quaker that, Meeting yeah, House, sure. yes. That would probably be mine. David, do you have a, a place in Millbrook that you feel like you have a connection to? Well, for me, it was coming up and uh, as a high school student and going to Bennett and having, uh, being interviewed at Bennett and being a part of that. And for me, it was magical. Bennett was such a special place. For those of you who grew up in the community, you kind of took it for granted, but it was such a destination. And for so many of the girls that came here, they came from all around the world to be at Bennett. And they, they created a new family and, and legacy. And that family 
of Bennett School Girls is with us today, even though they may not be here. Their legacy is. Um, people have questions in the audience for David and Dan? Or? Well, first one I saw was, is that Fred back there? <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about the Quaker community? How long has it been in the community? Is it still very active? I mean, well, the, the Quaker community is very interesting because the Quakers uh, came up and they, many of the Quaker families were involved with uh, commercial activities and they tried to be along the Hudson River, but no one wanted to have anything to do with Quakers. So in order to be in the area, they ended up coming to a section of Dutchess County that no one wanted to be in, and that was Nine Partners. And they came to Nine Partners in the middle of nowhere because of one reason, the east branch of the Wappinger Creek, because they could set up mills along the site for all the grain produce and so on. And that legacy is well documented and written. So if there's one thing that makes our community special, it's the, the fact that the east branch of the Wappinger Creek drops 90 feet from one, its first source coming into the county to where it leaves Dutchess County. 90 feet. And the number of mills that were created along that to put the water in. And, and also the fact that who worked in them? Well, the Quakers didn't believe in slavery. So a lot of the, the blacks that had been slaves, former slaves, ended up settling in the area and doing work in the community and they worked at the mills, they worked in the fields, and they were paid for it. So that, that quality, and at the Quaker Meeting House, to realize the Meeting House, and in the cemetery itself, that every marker, modest though it may be, documents another person who was a Quaker in the And the, the Nine Partners boarding school was right next door to the Meeting House. It no longer stands, but as for current Quakerism, I think Jonathan Boyce is the person to ask. And one of the important things about the Quakers is that they believed that girls had, should have the same opportunity in terms of math and science and academics as the boys. And the other communities, greater communities in the area said, no, that's not what women are for. They have, they have one job, and, that's, and that one job is to take care of the home and hearth and children, and that uh, girls don't need to read and write. And the Quakers said, no, we're all in God's image. And to be able to teach at the Nine Partner School the fact that girls were introduced to them to the school as well as the boys. Well, I believe Nine Partners was the first co-educational boarding school yes, in the was. country, wasn't it? In the it? country. And I'll just say about Nine Partners that the male and female students were largely taught the same curriculum, but they were taught in um, segregated classrooms, right? So the, mm -hmm. the male students were in one part of the school with um, a male teacher, and the female students were in another part of the school um, with the female teacher. Um, and so there was kind of segregation in the school, um, but there was still kind of equality in terms of the curriculum that they were exposed to. To answer the question about um, like the, the Quaker community today, I, mean, I think most people probably know this, but in the summer when it's warm, because there's no heating in the, the Quaker meeting house really, um, it is open on Sunday mornings. And usually there's one family, I think, that goes to worship there. But I think other people could go if they wanted to. I think they probably feel welcome and they're very much in the spirit of um, kind of Quaker worship, I think. And I would like to just add that at our Philip Hart house, which was built circa 1800, Philip Hart's wife was Susanna Aiken um, from Pauling, uh, the Aiken family, if you know the Aiken Library down in Pauling on Quaker Hill. Uh, so she was Quaker and basically simplicity, and he was known as the worldly Baptist. <laughs> so there was your contrast, a Quaker wife with a worldly Baptist for a husband. Other questions? Or? 
that's, that on your calendar. You had a, one of a person involved in suffrage. What year was that on the calendar? Uh, actually, I think you misspoke. I think that was the co-education in March. Co-education. Uh, so it wasn't suffrage? it wasn't suffrage, but I'm trying to think if we did have anything in terms of women's suffrage in no, one just, of the calendar. I took a picture of a plaque from Master College, and uh, there was in uh, 1908 um, votes for women. Inez Milholland, disobeying Master College president led a 1908 suffrage meeting here with talks by Harriet Stanton Blatch and Rose Schneider. I just took this the other day. And that was where? At Master College. Ah. And they're all very famous figures in the suffrage movement at that yeah. time. Yeah. And, yeah. and as Mulholland was mm -hmm. and so that person. Yeah. 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 connected in some way. Right. Yeah, this one was celebrating 200 years of co-education. Okay with the Nine Party Partners Boarding School, as far as that went. Nan and David, you did a great job. You made it! I know. I haven't been here for years. My name is Kathy Moyer, and I'm the one writing the book still on Nine Partners Boarding School in Sandler's. So I wanted to give an update. The sampler that they have, which is one of the most important of all the samplers of which we have known, and I'm over 50 extant Nine Partners samplers signed and acknowledged but the significance now is that I've been invited to join the Sampler Consortium, which is a group of women who are documenting samplers from across the country, and I'm representing nine partners. Oh. And Dutchess County, but most of them are wearing my nine partners hat. So I am telling them all about the lovely things that we've been working on over the years because David and Ann have been so generous with their time in helping me in at Hyde, and all the things over at the meeting house and the cemetery, et cetera. So, they are working on And this, by the way, is Kathy Moyer of Poughkeepsie, a dear friend and yes. a wonderful scholar. Yes, and years ago, back in 2009, we were trying to organize a Quaker symposium. We made a great progress, but you all remember the big hit that hit in 2008 with the financial e collapse. And so the entire world kind of came to a standstill in terms of consortiums, conferences, and everything. And we had to close, and unfortunately, at the time. But we had, at that point, we had made plans to mount a Nine Partners Sampler Exhibit, and the consortium is looking to one of their first groups to be the Dutchess County. Out of the whole country, they're picking Dutchess County. <laughs> and if they have an exhibit, I will be contacting you, very obviously, to see what we can do to mount one from the other nine samplers that we have here, and um, inform everybody in the Historical Society as well. So it's really a very exciting time. It's, it's great, great news, and I hope to get back to the book soon. One of these days I'll be feeling better. But. Wonderful. It is. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak about it. If you have any questions on Nine Partners, well, I want to also mention the other reason the Quakers came here, David, which you know is because they didn't want to be tainted by those worldly ways of the outside wicked world. They had to be apart because they wanted to stay steadfast in their belief, in their terms, their beliefs and their practices, which meant no fancy stuff, no bright colors, no swearing, no cursing, no dancing, no music, no nothing. So the worldly people had to be away from them so they could be safe here in the Millbrook area with the things that they wanted to teach their children about the way they wanted to worship. So that's another reason why they settled out here. Besides the mills and all the great things that they had available and, and of course, the way that they worked on it with the Philip Hart House and his mills, et cetera, et cetera. So the story here is, I think, the biggest, best of all of the county. And if I may say so, also one of the state. We really have a great, great, great tradition here in, in this county for so many wonderful things. And I thank you all for being the historians for the Millbrook part of it, and Nine Partners School specifically. It's, it's been wonderful to have you people here to help me through my journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Just about the, the idea that you know, the Quakers were trying to separate themselves from other influences and other groups. If you think of where there were Quaker settlements, often the places today where there were Quaker settlements are places where kind of wealthy people have second homes because they're kind of like isolated places. So like Millbrook kind of falls in that category. Pauling kind of falls in that category. A little farther afield, Nantucket, 
uh, Shelter Island at the end of Long Island. Like these are all places where there were significant Quaker settlements because they were isolated, right? And to some degree, they're still a little kind of isolated today. And so you can kind of track it that way in a way as well. Any other questions or comments? What exactly is a sampler? When you when you use that term, what does that mean? What is a sampler? What is a sampler? Kathy, you're much better <laughs> equipped to answer that. The girls in the old days, no matter they were in the secular school or not, were taught the skill of needlework because in those days there were no stores to go to get what you needed to do. So in order to practice that, they did samplers, which you'll see on the one from Mary Collins, that practiced the alphabet, big and small, the numbers, and then they would have oftentimes a verse. Always oh, a Quaker, of course, was very pious, very pious. And that would teach them the different arts that they had to use. The, the regular stitch, the queen stitch, the, there's a whole variety of stitches that they used. And also it taught them reading, reinforcing the alphabet to them, writing, and all the things that you had to know as a young girl in the Quaker society. And it also reinforced some of the discipline that you needed because you had to keep in your lines. And those teachers were quite strict about making sure all the things, go look at it in person. This is one of the best samples around. They're so fortunate to have it. So the girls all learned that, and they learned different styles. They did different ones at different periods, and they learned a little bit of darning and everything else. So this was part of the staple. The girls did the girls' part in their school, but they also had the sampler part. The boys went on to do, I believe it was higher level things like um, astronomy or business management practice. I believe all that in those days. Very strict curriculum. My God, the stuff they learned. They did their part. The students only met at mealtime when they were permitted to walk down a set of stairs to go into this large cafeteria to eat, where they were all segregated. But on the staircase, if you were going down at the same time as a male that you liked, you might surreptitiously kind of wink at them or something, you know, to show that you were interested in them or whatever. You didn't dare speak, and you didn't do much like passing notes around. But they had a little ability to see one another, not much. And they also might meet in church, what they would call their worship right here down the road at Nine Partners Meetings Schoolhouse. And they would also go out in the playground, separately, of course. But there have been known instances where siblings, boys and girls, would pass notes back and forth to one another, saying, you're my sister, and you like that person, that he likes that, and she likes that. And next thing you know, this note went all the way around to say, somebody was sweet on you. And they were trying to convey that to you, which, of course, they couldn't do too much of that. But they did try various ways. There was also a knot in one of the holes, in one of the fences, that they could peek through. And you weren't supposed to do that, but if the boys were caught peeking into the girls' part of the yard and this not hold, oh, they'd be disciplined. They were very strict on discipline, but they could sneak some way surreptitiously every now and again to contact the opposite sex. Any <laughs> questions? Sure. I want to know, were the first sidewalk cement or wood? The were the first sidewalks cement or wood? They were cement, the way they were set up. It was a state of the art at the time mm -hmm. and very progressive. Uh, in other areas, there could be wood supports to get into the wagons, but to have actual sidewalks, uh, it was the reality of our community when it was set up. Keep in mind that uh, Millbrook, the original communities were nine partners, Hearts Village, and these small rural communities. And when Merritt Franklin, uh, Franklin Merritt rather, uh, laid out the, the village, he set it up specifically to have sidewalks. So the, the, the whole layout of it was fabricated from scratch to be the, the classic example of what we think of as Millbrook today. And what a coincidence, his name was Franklin Merritt and the main street is Franklin Avenue, and the parallel street is Merritt Avenue. <laughs> yeah. I just I just wanted to say that there is a thing a style called Quaker colonial architecture, and it's usually overlooked because it comes instantly English. But there is a set Quaker style house. Any other questions? Um, and, and do you, wait, can I just say, and do you live in one? Or is it one I was Yes, in? half of mine is in okay. the footprint of one. Okay. And I'll just make it quick. It's three rooms on the first floor, 
and it's four bedrooms on the second floor, and the bedrooms are all in the corners. That's pretty much what it is. It's very functional. I quickly say it's like the Bauhaus, but you don't, not everybody knows what the Bauhaus movement was. But you can find Quaker houses of many different, it can be wood, it can be stone, clabbered. But it's the floor plan of the tight control of space. And it's usually a square or a rectangle. That's pretty much it. Jonathan, I might ask you to start our show and tell portion of the program. Um, and as you're kind of moving over here, I'll just say one last thing to kind of wrap up um, this portion here. Um, some of you may know this. I live right across the street from David and Ned. And the house that I live in was <coughs> Philip Hart's original house from maybe 1760 or so, which is kind of modest. And he became more prosperous over time and thought he deserved a nicer, kind of grander house for himself. And so he actually moved my house across Route 44, put it where it is now, and then built the, the larger house where, where David and Ann live and drew them to, to the community. When I bought my house maybe 13 years ago, um, David and Nan reached out to me. I didn't really know them at the time. I don't think I'd ever met them, um, although I lived in an apartment in Millbrook for a few years. And they left a little note um, uh, and a handwritten card on my door um, welcoming me to their little you know, neighborhood, Parts Village, um, inviting me over for dinner in their house. They could give me a tour of it. Um, and I, I still have the card. I've saved it all these years. And um, I remember what it said. It just said, welcome home. Aww. And it was, it was so, you know, profoundly kind and welcoming on their part. And, you know, <clears throat> we've been good neighbors, I think, you know, in the 13 years that I've lived there. It's nice to know the people who live right across the street in our little community. Um, Jonathan, you want to? Well, I've been active in the New York Historical Society for around 10 years and just become a big, big part of my life. I've made such great friends and uh, it, uh, my only regret is that I didn't get into it 20 years sooner. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a collector of all sorts of things. But I brought notebook related stuff tonight and the oldest piece I have is this coffee mill made by Swift, 1845, and I just bought it today <laughs> at the Antique Center. It's been there a while, and I had to authenticate it before to be sure. Then I saw a couple more down in the archives, and I said, aha, that's what it is. So it, it, does, it, it doesn't say Millbrook on it. It just says Swift, and it's got a patent date of 1845. And apparently it hung by three screws in a doorway or on a beam. I don't know. Have you tried it out? Does it still work? <laughs> I just tried it this yes. afternoon. Right. <laughs> we, do, we might have that at the farmer's market <laughs> next summer. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, I live in the Variah Swift house on Valley Farm Road. And have one just a couple years older than that of the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't had a chance to study them. I don't know the variations. Yeah. Well, the Swiss were known for their coffee. They were one of the more well-known people here in the area. Yeah. Well, that, the whole the whole valley was. The, they were Quakers as well, were they not? The Swiss. Yes. Yeah. yeah some of the, the Swiss went to school at Nine Partners as well. Yeah, yeah. So all those houses, that style that was mentioned of the Quaker box style, all those houses on Valley Farm Road started as that. Well, anyway, I live in the Bariah Swift house, so mm -hmm. it's fun to mm -hmm. see that you got that and brought it today. Yeah, I was really excited to find it and finally get it. Yeah. And this <coughs> rhythm cream pimento cheese made from pasteurized sweet cream the Dale Stacy Company, Incorporated, Millbrook, New York. Oh, so I, I'm going to guess on the time frame, 
this probably, the Dell Stacy Cheese Company probably went out of business about the time the railroad tracks were ter torn up. And Alva <coughs> Stacy then started <coughs> GLF store behind, on Washington Avenue behind what was the mo movie theater. And I think he owned all that property, including the movie theater, but he didn't run the theater. Somebody else ran it. And uh, he died in 1965. And I went to work for his wife, Ruth Stacy, in 1966, doing yard work. And I was still there when she died in 1990. So that's, uh, oh, and David will appreciate this. It's got, a, it has second use. My brother, when Chub Wicker's store went out of business, he bought a lot of stuff from them. And Chub Wicker had used this box and others like it to hold bicycle parts. <laughs> because they sold bicycle parts and did repairs for the Bennett School girls. And uh, so my brother wrapped this up, gave it to me for Christmas probably 15 years ago. I was thrilled. I have one of those in my house, Jonathan, and I keep uh, old postcards in it. But I just like the idea of like buying cheese in that quantity. I can relate to that. <laughs> and then, let's see. I've got this folding yardstick. BJ, PZ, Norwalk NY, and they sold Andy's stoves and cook stoves. And I'm well familiar with Andy's cook stoves. Because my aunt had one in her farmhouse her whole life. And it was a big, big wood stove that burned wood. And she did all her cooking on that, and it was always warm in that kitchen. Especially in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, Andy Stoves and Ranges, made by Phillips and Clark Stove Company, Geneva, New York. And Andy Stoves and Ranges for sale by B.J. Peasy, Milbrook, N.Y. Now, the only person I've talked to that remembers this is Skip Dixon. I wish he was here tonight, because he might be able to give us a time frame of when they are here or when they are in business. So, that's it. And then I have a, a letter over from Paul J. Haight Company. Oh, Skip. Yeah. Yeah. And it says, good luck on it. Now, this is made of copper, so they weren't very good as letter over. And this one's never been bent. But I've seen a few of them that were bent. And if they've been bent, you can always tell they never can be straightened 100%. And Paul J. Haight sold coal, fuel, oil, lumber, kind of in, in the area where the bookstore is, but I'm not too clear about that. Yeah, that building, the bookstore building. And, um, This is a yard steel, yard stick from the Home Oil Company. And I don't know who was, who was the owner of the Home Oil Company, but it's now where the sewage treatment plant is. And the phone number starts with OR7 instead of 677. That dates it, but I'm not quite sure even you know, when that was, but it's, it's, it's a while now. Now this is special. Pure Lard, Trip and Hicks, Norfolk, New York. Oh. And I got, I got this last night as a gift from Kevin DiMartino owns a bottle shop. A pretty nice gift. I was thrilled. <laughs> this is a picture of Rim Briggs. Probably many of you have seen this. 1933. And uh, it's, on our, it's in one of our calendars, and there's a lot of them floating around framed like this. And I got it from a friend who got it from a friend, and they're around. And the, uh, if you look at it carefully, you can see upstairs the sign for the George Whalen <coughs> insurance. And it is, yep, yeah, there it is right there. And I remember when I was a kid, <coughs> I got my first truck on the road, going up there every month to pay my car insurance. So George Whalen the first. 
now we're on George the Fourth. <laughs> This is a piece of sales literature. You're all welcome to look at all this stuff afterward. <clears throat> From Murtaugh's Motor Service. And they sold Studebakers in what's now the Motor Vehicle Building. And if you look at the picture, you'll know right away what building it is. It hasn't changed all that much. And uh, it's got two stuff on two sides. And I got it in a shop in Stanfordville. Bull's Head Treasures, and I couldn't believe who it was sent to. It was sent to Gerard Martin in Washington Hollow, who was Kevin Martin's father, who was in business with my brother at Boyce and Martin Mower Shop. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really an amazing piece. And you're welcome to look at it, but don't take it out of the, the folder. Because it, it's very, you know, it's from 1950, and it's fragile. Now, this is an interesting story. It has the 2002 calendar, which I thought, well, that's, that's okay. It was uh, no big deal. It's given to us by Faith Tildesley, Edna Tildesley's daughter, last, last Friday at the diner. And I got it home, started leaking through it, and, and Edna had put historical notes, handwritten historical notes with pencil on about six of the pages. And so I'm going to write a little article to go with it and be sure it gets in a special place in the archives. Because that, it's, it's a, I was so excited when I saw it and I haven't talked to Faith yet. I don't know if she knew that the writing was in there. But I was just beside myself when I saw it. And I also had the 2004 calendar, which was dedicated to, to Edna because she died in 2003. So this 2002 was probably her last calendar. And, and her, her writing and everything was really good. It's easy to read. And she was 1991, I guess, at that point. And it, it's, it's really, really special. This, this box that my brother has been in doesn't really have anything to do with Millbrook except Toby Collins gave it to Mrs. Shrubsoul. Mrs. Shrubsoul's first husband's name was Dwight. And then she married Mr. Shrubsoul, Eric Shrubsoul, after Dwight died. And a couple of months ago, she was moving to down here to Friendly Lane, to another house she owns here and has an apartment in, from Maple Avenue. So I looked at the box and said, what are you going to do with that box? Do you want it? <laughs> so, so I said, I'll give it a real good home. Yeah. So, uh, and when you come up and look at it, it's soap crystals. Now, what the what the significance of the cow is, maybe somebody else can answer that, I don't know. But you, so I've seen cows used in, in other old boxes, so I don't know what that, what the significance of that is. So, uh, I also have Faith Tillotsley's book about her mother, and I've got a signed copy. So, <laughs> so that's kind of special too. And I've read the whole I'm not sure you brought this. Or yeah, Alan, go ahead. I'll share an artifact. Well, it's a, it's a small artifact. My name is Alan Meyer, but I'm Al, uh, Alan's brother-in-law. My brother Scott owned the bookstore. And when, they mo when he moved from Spagnola's over to the old feed and grain building, they dug up the ground and were putting in new floors and stuff. And they unearthed a whole bunch of uh, railroad spikes. So, of course, me being a rail fan and I love trains, I grabbed a bunch of these, but this is the best of the bunch, but that's a... Nobody grew up on the railroad, you know, the bank was the railroad building, and so... Yeah. And I mean, the railroad ran and literally a few feet from the, the back of the bookstore. And there was a siding that apparently came down, and uh, that's where they dumped off all the feed and grain that came on the cars and such, so... 
Um, I brought that trunk, and um, I think I have to open it up again to be able to read it exactly why it's here. I've been in this area, well, I was on Butts Hollow Road starting in 1985, and now I'm on Valley Farm Road. But for almost 20 years on Butts Hollow Road, um, I lived at Homestead Farm, which was the Davis family farm from the 1830s. And my neighbors on the road were Art and Mary Morse. Um, and Mary was originally a Newland. And they had been there. They owned both sides of the road, farmers. Um, and when, uh, when we sold Homestead Farm, the man who bought it, Mr. Wertheimer, also wound up buying the Morse farm. And almost literally the day that it was going to be torn down, much to my dismay, I got a tip off from one of the people working on the teardown that it was happening. And I borrowed a pickup truck and went over with garbage bags and just loaded as much as I could at the last minute. People had ransacked the house and tipped out drawers. And the Historical Society, uh, about 10 years ago, I gave a lot of, you know, artifacts and letters and so on. But this I've hung on to for a while. Um, um, it, it was made by a saddlery in Fishkill Landing for, let's see, for Edward Newland. And the Newlands had come up from Flatbush to Butts Hollow Road. So um, Edward Newlands, Fishkill Landing. Um, and it just stayed in the family. And Russell Newland um, became, he was the, actually drew out the landscape for Migdale. And around 10 years ago, I had that handwritten map of the Migdale property um, restored and matted and framed and gave it to the Historical Society. But anyway, <coughs> he put his initials in Russell Newlands. Um, and I don't know if you want it or not. I'll take it home with me. Um, but if the Historical Society would like to have it, I know you probably only have room for so much, and it's hard to decide what's important to you and what's not. But um, Mr. Newland, by the way, was the 34th sheriff, number 34 in Dutchess County. He was the general manager of McDale, and his wife tutored Roswell Miller's children at McDale. They're all, you know, I could go on and on and on about <laughs> these families. But, it's know. such an interesting shape. What kind I of thing was used what for? What is it made out Well, I think that people didn't necessarily have luggage in the sense that we do. And sometimes when you look at old Western movies and stuff, you'll notice that there's this shape tied on to the stagecoach or something. And it actually, it's wood that had leather stretched over it and attached with metal studs. Um, and then it was painted. So I think it was a, a traveling case of some sort. You know, it has handles on the sides. Um, it's leather hinged. Um, also, I just threw these in here. I don't know if you want them or not, but why would anybody want a whole set? They look like straps or something, like razor straps. There's like a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Somebody a barber, perhaps? I, I don't know. I, they're, they're all basically the same size. Um, do, would you... Would you clean animal flesh, hides, or something with them, maybe? So it's it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's shaving? Yeah. So, because I mean, there's about 10 of them. 
<laughs> so you think like some of these might have been like a traveling barber or something? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Usually they fear just Yeah. Was it so, in there originally? Or um, no, it's just part and parcel of. Yeah. I just brought them along. Right? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, Anyone else who wants to. Do you want this or should I take it home with you? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. Over to Allison. Yeah, do yeah, something else to share. <laughs> He was a president of this society for a while, and I haven't seen him around. Does anybody know how Marston Morse is? Is this is this Stan Morse? Stan Morse. Yes, Stan Morse. Stan Morse. I haven't seen him like Marston lately. Morse. I saw him last no, August. Since the fall, I haven't seen him. Oh, anything else want to share? Robert, there's a gentleman here that has stuff he wants to. Oh yeah, sure. Go ahead. My name is David Turner, I'm a trustee with the Dutchess County Historical Society. I'm also a member of the Beacon Historical Society. This is a very interesting piece. There was a lot of uh, carriage manufacturers, so there's at least two in Beacon. So this might have been something attached to you know, one of the carriage manufacturers there. And Beacon is, was Fishkill Land. Yes, yeah. correct, yeah. Ah. Uh, but I brought my uh, postcard collection. I've been collecting for the past about 25 years since I was a little kid. And uh, I just brought my collection as some of the small hamlets like Burbank. And it comes up into Millbrook as well, but the most special views that I have, I feel, are the panoramic views of um, the Bennett School. Oh, and um, even shows some interior views of what the Grand Staircase looked like. Um, of course, this is in the height of like the 1910s, around that time. So feel free to look through everything for Bank. Mabbitsville is included, Washington Hollow as well. Yeah, that's great. That's what everyone wants to see. Mm -hmm. Peter, did you have something to Oh, yeah. Um, I brought the proverbial silver spoon. Okay. Uh, and uh, as you might know, um, silver back in the, uh, or silver spoons back in the uh, um, 18th, 19th, and even into the early 20th centuries were generally given at christenings uh, to the baby by their godparents. Um, it was a symbol of wealth and the hope for prosperity for the child. Um, they were very expensive back then. We sort of think of silver today as being commonplace, but back then it wasn't. Um, Hugh Collins told me that um, when this spoon was issued in 1960, or 1916, uh, the cost of it would probably feed a local farm family of four kids and their parents for a month. So it's very expensive. Um, and this particular one is uh, the only one I found in like 50 years of looking that was presented by the Millbrook Hunt to people who walked their puppies. Um, <laughs> when the puppies were born, they were sent out to the farm families to be socialized. Um, usually the mother uh, would be in charge of feeding and looking after the little children who would be playing with the puppies and getting them used to their names and all. Mm. And then, um, probably around August, the uh, puppy show would be held. And the uh, pup farm families would gather at the Mohawk Hunt Kennels. They would bring in uh, the puppies. They would be judged by local expert hound judges and awarded ribbons. But um, every family or every person who walked a puppy was also presented with the silver spoon. Uh, this was a tradition that was started in England and brought over here. And it remained um, in effect probably for about 10 or 15 years uh, until the hunt decided to keep all its puppies mostly at the kennels. So um, this is one that I'll <coughs> present to the Millbrook uh, Historical Society because there probably aren't too many of them around. Um, and. Um, so uh, when you hear people were born with the silver spoon in their mouth, well, sometimes they came with a puppy attached. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this event has turned into a bonanza for the historical <laughs> society. Uh, it's it's um, I just want to mention really quickly our uh, April program. You're going to get a mailing about it, but it's at a different location. So plan ahead for that. It is at St. Joseph's Church at the Parish Hall down there because there's a tie 
um, in with St. Joseph's. Um, so keep that in mind if you're planning on coming to our April program, right? Not our usual location. Um, I want to thank David and Nan and everyone who brought stuff and who spoke. Um, let's give them a round of applause. I will encourage you to come and look at stuff, and most importantly, we have cake. This is a special cake that Denise Bauer made that has a decoration on it, kind of a recreation of Denise, is it the town of Washington flag? Yeah. The town of Washington flag that we discovered somewhere. So there is cake, have cake, look at the sampler, look at the postcards, look at everything else that uh, people brought, and thank you all for coming tonight.